Hi YouTube. Thank you for watching these daily updates. It's Pamela Erlin here again today. Um, so sometimes over on the Ask Pamela Anything questions um, that you find on my Patreon channel, if you want to be a part of this and ask your questions, I'll link that below for you. Sometimes one person comes in and asks me such a profound question that I'm not even sure I can get through it. So I spent um, about 30 minutes writing down my responses to you for this one question because it's a question that I pondered all of my life and that I've also received a lot of answers to. So if I don't get to your other questions today, it's because this question is so incredible that I just couldn't, it's, it's a beautiful question. I just couldn't move beyond it. <laughs> so we're gonna get to that question in a minute. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to share with you is that today at 1 p.m. we're going to be sharing over on my Patreon channel um, for Tier 2 and up my Kripa Yoga. You guys didn't know that I have um, an Eastern Yoga practice that focuses on the eight limbs, not just asana, not just the physical. Physical is very limited for me. Um, but yeah, it's the other eight limbs. So today we're going to be talking about fear management and we're going to be doing Kriyas. Um, those are exercises, um, breath exercises and physical exercises, but these are very simple exercises for fear management. And the particular class today is about getting out of chaos. So I have a surprise for you. For the first time ever publicly, I'm going to be bringing in the collective of Abraham. So that for those of you um, Abraham followers, you're going to really, really love that. It is a beautiful collective. And I talk to them all the time personally, but I've never um, done anything publicly with them. So for the first time, Abraham's going to talk to us about what invocations we can use, what we can say, and how we can understand how to be happy no matter what, how to be peaceful in any chaotic situation. They're in my ear right now and it really itches. Oh. <laughs> all day. <laughs> the channeling, yeah channeling problems <laughs> um but they're incredible and i can't wait to share with you some of the reasons why these kriyas work and what they're saying what invocations follow what the basis of that from universal law of attraction is so excited to share 1 p.m i'll link it below um the question okay here it is the question that just put my heart into such a spin that i spent like 30 minutes writing down your answers which i'm about to read to you uh, okay, let me find my, first of all, I've got to find the Ask Pamela Anything question section. There it is. I wanted to read it from her perspective, but I can't seem to find it. It's been one of those days. <laughs> the question is, um, I've heard that things are light and dark, and I understand lightness and darkness. From this perspective, from the spiritual perspective, what are stars? I remember her question really clearly. She wanted to know if they were lightness, if they were darkness, if they were both. Um, that's what that was. I can't find the question in her words right now, but it just... I just loved the question. I love stars. I'm always staring at them and I just love them. <laughs> so yeah, I can't find the question. It's just gone. So I just tried to remember it as best as possible. So I wanted to start out with that with a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And the quote is, if a man be alone, let him look at the stars. He wrote that in his 1836 essay, Nature. And he also said in that essay, the rays that come from those heavenly worlds will separate between him and what he touches. Um, so Emerson considered stars and he considered them through what he called the perpetual presence of the sublime mysteries. And he considered them as portals to a complete absorption of something, something within you and something greater than anything that the human ego could possibly understand. So he also said, 
in that same essay, if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God, which has been shown? But every night come out these envoys of beauty and light the universe with their admonishing smile. I, I love his work, by the way. <laughs> Huge literary buff, love to read, but he's one of my favorites. So we've all been gazing at the night sky, you know, in fascination for millennia. And in that vastness, it's quite humbling. It's um, enigmatic even in its expansion. You know, ancient civilizations from the Mayans to the Babylonians were starstruck and always enchanted by the cosmos. Um, ancient Egyptians talk about it in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. You can see reference to it. Um, Egyptians used stars to align the Great Pyramids and the Earth's four cardinal points that we talk a lot about in my alchemy classes on Patreon. So sometimes when I channel Emerson, I ask him, what does he think about our modern culture today? <laughs> I won't give you that answer. <laughs> Um, he, sometimes I get like the Emerson face palm and other times I get the something poetic where he talks about how stars shine brighter when, uh, tumbled around in the universe perfectively. And he gives me this analogy of, um, crystals being put through a tumbler and then coming out shiny, you know? So that was his most recent yesterday. I asked him, what are we doing? And he's like, ah, oh, the crystal tumbler again. <laughs> stars. So when you um, think about that, um, the common stargazing that we used to all love so much seems to be in today's modern society kind of replaced and even transfixed by modern technology. We, we have our tablets and our phones up to our faces all day. And then suddenly in such a chaotic environment, the star sparkle is second best. So we don't notice most people walking around in the unawakened cloud of men mentality. Do not notice the great links that their soul travels to illuminate the night sky. Stars are your souls. That is the answer to your question. The ancients prized something that according to, I guess he is gonna give us the answer he said. <laughs> I, I love how he's like, I'm not going to give you that answer. And Emerson is who we're channeling today. And he's like, no, no, I'm going to give you the answer. He said, um, we fail to recognize that. We fail to recognize the most powerful accessibility to our own spiritual embodiment in today's chaos. The stars reveal your truest divine nature if you care to look. So when I was little, my favorite song was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And then it became my little one's favorite songs for a while. And they were fascinated with, you know, the little galactic lamps that would project the images up upon the ceiling. What are you projecting right now in your lives? You know, remember the that, that uh, lullabies comforting words, um, how I wonder what you are. I had been programming myself by singing that song at such a young age to wonder about everything. That's the beauty of stars. So um, you think about it again, going further into the etymology of that lullaby up above the world so high. It's as if I knew at a young age that a part of me not only belong to the stars, but like a diamond in the sky, diamonds are codes and you are that. I am the stars. We all are stars, etherically speaking, wrapped up in bodies and muscles and sinew and skin. Okay, so that is your answer. Emerson, crash my computer. I wanna be able to see your, <laughs> you can't even make this up. I should turn the camera around, it says, your computer restarted because of a problem. Please wait a few seconds <laughs> before restarting. It's restarting itself. Emerson, jeez, oh, I had so many things I wanna talk about with your other questions today. 
on Patreon, but now you guys are gonna have to wait with me while I restart my computer. I've been hacked so often that my password on my screen is longer than the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Did you see how long I took to type out that password to restart? I'll get to your questions in a minute, I promise. But these days I should keep a secondary device by me for as many times as spirits crash my computers. <laughs> Yeah, you guys been noticing that? Yes, I know your computer restarted because of a problem. <laughs> Hopefully it's gonna bring up all your questions. Otherwise, we'll just be sitting here looking at each other. <laughs> Reconnecting everything. So I'm so excited about the Abraham channeling today. It feels like being in the eye of the storm. I don't know if, if you guys feel that way, if you've observed that, if you've observed this feeling of being in the eye of the storm all the time, energetically, I feel like I'm right in the middle, just observing it spiraling around me and all the chaos just pushing around and I'm in the center going, mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> it's because of these Kriyas that I do, you know, um, that I'm able to remain completely at calm. I've had um, so much going on. All right, let's get back to your questions. Emerson, I'd ask you if you had anything more to say, but you crashed my computer last time. So <laughs> it's still reloading the Patreon page. <laughs> and opening it up, opening up Discord. Did you guys know that I have a Discord that we use on my Patreon channel to talk to each other? At least two or three times a month, we go on and have conversations. We put our videos on, we talk to each other. It's really personal. It's a lot of fun. It's one of the perks you get. Find the questions. All right. Questions, 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 questions. Um, I didn't, he didn't really answer your question. If you crash my computer again, I'm telling you, we will have to end this YouTube. <laughs> uh, what do you want to say now? Okay, more about stars. He wants to say more about stars. We're going to give him one more chance to not crash my computer. So he said, um, it's impossible to grasp the vastness of space in here, in your intellect. It just lacks any defining reference point. It lacks processing power. So much of space's magical qualities are felt in the heart, not comprehended by the thinking mind. Philosophers knew this. They could talk about God all day long, but what they were saying mattered not. It was what you were feeling about what they were saying. And this is why Emerson is the perfect person to talk about stars today. So take the measurement of the speed of light, for example. To our senses, light is instantaneous. You can flick a switch, light appears, the speed is unfathomable. When you work with stars and you understand that you are one, you are embodying God's light and moving so deeply into instantaneous manifest manifestation. So imagine a light year. That's next level. <laughs> um, that quote was Eric. He just popped in. He said, um, imagine a light year. That's next level. <laughs> so applying the switch flicking speed to how far light travels in 365 days that it would take for Earth to orbit the sun. If I flicked my light switch in my office and had a magical bulb projected into space, one light year is how far this light will have traveled by September 2020. I guess that's pretty far, right? So even light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach Earth. And that's kind of a brief sojourn compared to the distance light travels from distant stars to illuminate our sky, our night sky. So when you're contemplating these 
journeys of what Emerson calls these envoys of beauty and illumination, the unfathomable becomes a little bit more fathomable. So the universe is big and so are you. And the stars are a grand example of how to pull, pull forth God's greatest beauty, God's most illuminating beauty in a body. So in alchemy, in the tree of life, we call that Tiferet, God's grand beauty, God's um, um, illuminating beauty is what alchemists call that in mystery schools. So the universe of mind is what you're dealing with and it's instantaneous. Stars are examples of your deepest embodiment. You see them as light, but it's deeper than that. It's deeper than anything that I can describe. So when we look at the existential, such as trying to define stars without the framework, um, it becomes a rather nihilistic worldview and it strips the universe of spiritual meaning. So I believe this existential lifelessness that um, many nihilists talk about today, you know, in these new Advaita teachings particularly, <laughs> um, contributed significantly to periods of disenchantment, depression, anxiety, uh, apathy. And from the atheistic science mind background, there's no room for anything even beyond the material. So discerning from that way can be incredibly lonely but building a framework for the spiritual, not the religious, and not what your science can comprehend because remember what Emerson said, you can't from here. So understanding how to build a framework from something that you understand slowly because you are redesigning and remembering ancient paradigms that worked and getting rid of more modern paradigms that don't. And you're doing that brick by brick. When you are allowing mystical experiences of growing in probability and increased intuition um, as so prevalent in these times, um, you need an all-encompassing context and one that doesn't make you become completely apathetic. So in my experiences with observing stars, you know, each channeled information from a yogi or a teacher or anything um, became this gradual creation of a new worldview that matched my subjective embodied experiences and the mystery of the cosmos became resuscitated in my life. So now when I ponder this existential question, I feel wonder and I feel just as I did when I was a little child, singing twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So when you expand in this worldview, there's room for spirit. There's no superficial glass ceiling. You know, all the scientific pieces of me that I'd rejected as feasible in school are rejected because they might be untrue based upon science or irrational. All of those pieces within me can breathe freely as my eternal essence expands you know, from a constricted 10% confine <laughs> to a Fibonacci spiral of wonder, you know, soaring and expanding and soaring and expanding into the mysterious, into the unseen 96% of the cosmos, into the totality of beingness, into the totality of the universe. Stars are important because stars are ether, and you are a stardust. So our connection to stars isn't exclusively spiritual. Stars are the building blocks of the human body. They are the atoms, the elements. They are intertwined with the cosmos, with all of what you call your past lives and everything that you are now. Most of the material that we're made of comes of dying star matter. Our stars that died in explosions according to um, astrophysicist uh, Carol um, Shriver. I don't know how to say that name. Is it Shriver or, or Shrishver? So <laughs> you can look that up and do your research yourself. 
So despite what eyes and egos can perceive, most of our physical structure is only a few years old. Yeah, we're not fixed at all. We're more like a pattern or process that's dying and being reborn just like stars. And our cellular nature can only inhabit life for that amount of time before we die at a cellular nature, cells die and are reborn and die and are reborn. So we're more like a pattern or a process or a cosmic wheel. You know, we lose 30,000 skin cells every minute and our entire surface layer of the skin is replaced roughly once a year. So by the time we're age, I think 52, half of our heart cells have been replaced. Cell division is needed to survive and to grow. And when cells die, they need to be replaced. And this is where stars help out. This is what stars are. Okay, that's it. I'm going to move on to your questions now. I could talk about stars all day. I love talking about stars. So you, you at whoever asked that question, you, um, you got me. <laughs> 30 whole minutes of me. <laughs> that was what that was. Uh, next question. Okay, micros okay, lens, microscope lens. So what are you saying? Hmm. People just saying hi. I don't see a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, from Jenny, she says, I'm feeling open to what the universe has in store. Training wheels are coming off. Uh, as we walk the path home, how do we keep ourselves neutral to distractions? Um, the energy of grace. In order to remain neutral, you have to be able to see everything in the world as peaceful. And if you can't see it as peaceful, you must see it as innocent. If you can't see it as innocence, you must forgive it. We talked about the technology of forgiveness yesterday in my Discord chat, and I remember saying back to you, let me help you make forgiveness easier. Forgiveness means you understand that everyone is God and everyone is love. Now their actions, Yeshua never said to me in channeling at all that our actions are innocent. He said, we are. So when you're forgiving people, and attempting to forgive their actions, you can forgive, but you don't need to forget. Boundaries are a part of what I call self-care. Self-care is necessary for self-love. You can love people in and understand their pain and suffering as being the cause of negative behaviors and harsh, painful behaviors, and still love them because the universe is love. So we're gonna be talking about ways to be happy and to forgive people no matter what um, in class today. We're going to be channeling Abraham and bringing forth that information today. Okay. One o'clock guys, I'll link it below. Um, Okay, this is a question. I really loved this question and I have a story to give you. Um, I just really relate to this big time. This is from Karen. She said, I'm feeling a lot of energy today. Kind of lightheaded and sleepy, it's hard to focus. That was me yesterday too, I actually needed a nap. <laughs> And then she states, is there a good way to respond to people that are really not seeing the big picture when it comes to all the things going on in our world today? For example, they people appear to be very triggered by your president and Black Lives Matter and such. Should we say something or just let them be in their own space? Um, I don't want you to allow my answer to make you judge me as feeling that Black Lives uh, do not matter because they absolutely do. And any movement is likely to be some degree of human chaos that when you're feeling peaceful and powerful, you can move. Chaos can be creation. There is a universal law even. It's called the universal law of chaos. And you go forth and you become active and you make change. That's what's going on in society. That's beautiful until you suffer and you allow yourself to suffer too much 
that becomes actual insanity and dysfunction. And a lot of that is going on. And then people are blaming Black Lives Matter, you know, and, and riots and things. Um, riots are not the problem. You know, it's the insanity of people not being able to stand in chaos that's the problem. So go back to my Yeshua channeling to get Yeshua's view on how to do that without being, how to be chaotic and to change and be creative without, you know, can you be peaceful and stand by a rioter who's angry and let that be a lighthouse of peace to that being? You can, but only you know if you should. This is your time to personally decide how much responsibility you wanna take for this change and how to become functional within it. And when you need to step back and for your own sanity, take a breather. Okay. Um, another thing is remember the three types of business, your business, God's business, someone else's business. Black Lives Matter is everyone's business. And that is just what it is. I find that what suffering lands in our laps when we insert ourselves deeply in business other than our own. And I'll remind you of something that Sadhguru said once, a deeply respected yogi on this planet. He said, I am not here to advise nor be advised. I adopted the statement and I've been teaching it ever since then because it's true. I land out of suffering when I can stand peacefully within the universal law of chaos and send that love and light and peace into the universe and still be a powerful part of change. No denial. But I land peaceably and functionally within this when I can understand that I am not here to advise people that aren't asking my advice. Okay? Um, I'm not. It's not my place. And I refuse to accept advice when people tell me I am a part of a problem. That feels belittling and painful, and it causes me suffering. Um, I don't believe that Black Lives Matter was ever meant to make you personally feel guilt and shame, but to help you understand a large part of a collective problem, okay, which you can peaceably begin to change. You know, it's... A tough thing, but if people aren't asking your advice, why are you giving it? I come on here daily because you ask questions and I answer because you ask me to. When you ask me for advice, I can give it. Otherwise, I do not. Don't come to me to assume that I want your advice when I'm not asking either, because I don't. I stand so deeply within my power that I do not require your advice until I do. And when I do, I will humbly ask for it. There are only a few trusted people on this planet that I go to for advice, okay? Most of them live in my household. <laughs> That's how close my circle is. I'm not asking for advice otherwise and I will not receive it. When it comes in my direction, I will say, thank you, I love you, no thank you. Thank you, I love you, but no thank you. I repeat that. When people try to give you, try to give you advice, it will make you suffer if you take it when you didn't ask for it. So someone asked me a question on YouTube and I'm not sure if you deleted the question or if the question was just no longer relevant after my typed answer, but I promised you on YouTube that I would share a story about this because of your question. Um, you asked me about healers and empaths who just feel this compassionate pain almost of suffering. So many empaths do, and I have completely been there. It is a call for compassion, but not for offering advice or fixing people. When you attempt to fix people, you rid them of their power, especially if they didn't ask. So as much as we think that giving advice and helping people and, and giving information um, might be beneficial when we think that they're missing something, when we think that they're not in their power. Notice I said, when we think, when we think, it's the head coming in going, oh no, 
they're off track. Oh no, they're this. Oh no, they're, it's bad. How do we know that? Did they say that? Did they ask? So let me share you a story. There was a yogi who fell asleep, a deep, beautiful, peaceful samadhi, not for a week, not for a month, for over a year, you know, in a forest by himself under a tree, you know, half naked as yogis do, <laughs> hair growing long, you know, getting skinny. You do that sometimes when you're out in India and really connecting to God. Uh, that's why I don't go to India because I have a feeling that would happen. People would literally have to wake me up. It's just so, so many, so much part of me. Um, so this yogi, he was sitting under the tree in this deep samadhi. He had his alms bowl out because in, in, um, there's a tradition for certain uh, puja uh, and worship and, and, and prayer and meditation tools. So that alms bowl is one of them. And this yogi had had this bowl for years. He set it out, it was falling apart, all ragged, probably looked like it could barely hold any energy. And students would go by and other meditators would come and join in the, in the beautiful samadhi because he went into the samadhi with this lovely smile on his face and his toenails were growing and his hair was getting long and um, he was just so divinely communed with God, so connected. But people were starting to get worried. They're like, oh, I'm gonna leave him some food, I'm gonna leave him some water, it's been a year now. You know what, and I'm gonna replace that crickety looking alms bowl and um, give him something that's fit for the meditator that he is. Now, if you know anything about those type of yogis, when you wake up, you need all your puja supplies and you don't need them to be touched. But loving, helpful, compassionate people did that. They replaced the bowl to something nice and golden and shiny. And when he woke up, he could not energetically replenish his body or his spirit because that ancient dilapidated bowl had been given by his masters, had been passed down from generations and it held the exact energetic structure required for the replenishment of his mind, body, and spirit. So he had to go hunt it down and find it and he got it back and he was fine, but it was a lot of trouble. And he couldn't replenish his body for a long time along the search. This is what we do when impasse on the planet, when we're offering, when we're perpetually offering our services and advice. Um, and what we're doing is we're making an assumption that someone is broken, unhealed, and powerless. So just keep that in mind when you want to offer advice. Remember what I said, I, I am not here to advise you nor to be advised by you. There are very few people who merge with my energetic circle enough for me to receive advice. And it's um, when I need to, I'll ask. When you need to, you'll ask, right? So that's my answer to your question. I'll see you guys today. It's been 30 minutes, need to go, but I'll see you today at uh, 1 p.m. for the channeling of Abraham Hicks. You'll be able to answer, your, get, get your questions asked. Um, and we're gonna wrap these Kriyas, these teachings around how to be peaceful and content in chaotic, stressful, fear-based environments. Really needed in society right now. I hope you'll join me. Namaste.